I don't think we have any time to waste. We got to just jump right into this one, huh, pal? Give it a go. Okay, Darby Cast Doctors, it is Economics Wednesday. We have been off for a couple days. Check that, a couple weeks. And there's good reason. I have been entirely preoccupied with two things and two things only. Some of you right now who are really clairvoyant, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for everybody else, I'm thinking about the Wild West and I'm thinking about vampires. There's just not a whole lot else going on when we really kind of trim the fat off the issues of society, right? You just kind of backtrace it and it's like, whoa, Wild West, vampires, silver bullets, Samuel Colt, Black Bart, Wells Fargo, right? Woo. Yeah. Oh, it all comes together. It all comes together. It always does. But as a lot of you know, the Wild West, it's not going on right now. It's not. So what do we do on the Darby cast when the time's not right? That's correct. We step into the time machine. The aircraft carrier that doubles as a time machine. And you just go to your station. You look at your pristine station. Just close your eyes for a second. Imagine this. You board the SS Darby cast and you show up at your time travel liaising station because that's your role is to liaise time travel stuff. Super important. You left it just the way it needed to be left last time you used your liaising station. Of course, it looks perfect. You don't leave a messy workstation. Goodness gracious. Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. We know that. We know that, right? You don't have a big gulp just collecting dust, as big gulps do. But you've been on a couple time travel journeys. If you're a Darby Cast doctor, you've been to medieval times in the UK with Christina Aguilera, myself, and Slash. You've also been to 1693 Caribbean Tortuga with ex-WWF wrestler China. But now I am demanding that you get in the time machine because we're going and we got some stuff to handle. I have already made the short list. I already know exactly who is going to be on this time travel journey. Oh, you better believe it. Like I said, I... uh I've been taking some time to really mull over the stuff that matters, and that is certainly defeating vampires on the American frontier using time travel and key associates. Some might call us a posse. A posse! Very bold is what we are. That's what everyone would check that will describe us as when we arrive in 1864, California, Northern California, right by the border of Southern Oregon. That's where we're going. That's where and when is 1864. That's our year, gang. But let me tell you about the team, the squad, the posse. You need to know who's getting involved. From the... 2015 2016 presidential election town hall debate, which was, I believe, debate number three. Kyle, check that. Was it number one, two, or three? Doesn't matter. But we will be bringing Ken Bone, the mustachioed, kind of pervert looking dude, who asked like a really great question. I don't remember what it was, but he is so educated. He was, and Guys like that, their education only increases over time. He's going to be a major necessity for the posse. He's going to do more stuff than I think any of us realize. And Ken wouldn't put up a fight. You show up at Ken's house, check that. We show up at Ken's house. We say, Ken, 
you game for some time travel, and he just gives you this really sly, perverted little grin where it's like, Ken, I know you're happy, but you're, the way you're looking at us just gives us the creeps. But he totally disregards that because he's so studied. He's like, I know how I come off. And we're like, okay, Ken, get in the time machine. Game time. Who else are we picking up? We got to do a little time travel to pick this fella up. We're going to pick up Yoshio Miki, a Japanese 110-meter hurdler who competed in the 1928 Olympic Games. He didn't place, so most people don't know who this is, but he's like, he is pretty important. So we show up and we're like, Yoshio, um, what do you say, pal? And he doesn't even speak English, but he sees our impressive time machine and he's like, wow, nice tech. At least that's what the look in his eyes says. So he comes aboard the time machine and then we just have one guy left. You say, well, hey, what about the ladies? Not on this trip. Not on this trip. The Wild West. Vampires? I don't want ladies getting hurt. I just don't. That's chivalry for you, in case you were wondering. Who's our last person that we're picking up on this time travel journey? That's right. 2017 BitConnect cryptocurrency scam convention presenter Carlos Matos. And you show up at Carlos's house in New York in 2017 before the presentation. Now, why did I say before? Because we're going to deprive the world of Carlos. You're scratching your head right now. You're saying, no, no, the world needs more Carlos Matos. And I tend to agree with that. But we're going to pick him up right before the BitConnect presentation. And he just says, Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. And Ken's a little bit confused. So Carlos turns to him and then he says, Hey, 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 everybody. My name is Carlos Matos and I am coming from New York City, New York. Ken's totally bought in. Carlos looks at Yoshio. Carlos knows that Yoshio's English isn't super strong, so he's going to need to improvise and use happy, loud words. Then he just drops. What's so, 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 And I'm so impressed with Carlos, as are you. And you just turn to Carlos and you're like, hey, uh, Carlos, can you just... um." How do you feel right now? Because I love your energy. And then he just says, Let me tell you guys that I am so excited. I am so happy. I am really so thrilled to be right now sharing this amazing, glorious, super and exciting moment of my life with all of you guys. And I'm impressed. You're impressed. Everyone's impressed with what he's bringing to the table. We always, no matter what we're doing, whether we're on a time travel journey or otherwise, we always need people with high energy in our lives, and we should all be so lucky as to even get a taste of what Carlos brings to the table on a daily basis, right? And so I turn to the entire crew, and I'm like, do you know why we're going back to the Wild West? And Carlos can't contain himself, so obviously he pipes in and says, and let me tell you that we are really changing the world as we know it. And I say, excellent, Carlos. You get it. You understand these vampires are doing damage and we need to uproot the problem to save the future. Carlos can't contain his enthusiasm and he yells, The world is not anymore the way it used to be. Mm -hmm, no, no, no. So we've got a dream team here, right? Like you talk about the 92 Olympic basketball Barcelona quote unquote dream team. From now on, people are going to be saying Ken Bone, Yoshio, Miki, Carlos Matos, me, and this narrator of a podcast. That was the starting five of the dream team. Say that today to somebody. When you see them, after you've listened to this whole podcast all the way through, 
go up to a stranger today and be like, can I tell you about the dream team? And they say, oh, 92 Barcelona games, right on Michael Jordan. And you just slap them. You say, you are so ignorant. Now, let me tell you about a journey of epic proportions that made the world livable today. You ever heard about the past? Ever wish you could go there, do some things differently? Well, then listen up. That's exactly what you say to a stranger later today. But I give you a pep talk, as I always do on our time travel journeys. And I say, I need you to bring skills of bandits and skills of lawmen. Because what we're doing here today and for the next eh, couple weeks, couple months, long as it takes, sometimes I'm going to need high ethics plays out of you. Sometimes I'm going to need low ethics plays out of you. And you turn to Carlos and you're like, Carlos, what do you want out of this? Because, I mean, we're all thinking it and you're just a pro. You ask the question. Carlos is the, he's the lifeblood of this team. And I know that just kind of gave you the chills because we're dealing with vampires and we just talked about lifeblood. We can't have anything bad happen to Carlos. That's what you just thought. That's what I do on the Darby cast. I narrate your thoughts from time to time. So, again, you ask Carlos, like, what are you in, in, this, uh, in this for? He says, $25,610. And boy, does everybody just respect that. He knows the exact amount that he's in for. And that's it. That's all he needs. Talk about a guy who knows how to budget. Some of you are wondering, what is Ken Bone doing right now? He's reading. He's reading up on history, trying to figure out where we need to start in our vampire hunt. That's right. Ken is the eminent scholar of this entire expedition. Some of you right now are asking, what are you doing? What, what's your role in this? And I'm going to tell you right now, it's glue guy. Because eventually, everybody's going to be pushed to a breaking point. Even Carlos. Everybody is going to want to split up because hunting vampires is no joke. They operate at night and they're fast and some of them can fly and most of them are not appropriate in their conduct. You think any team can just stay together through an onslaught of vampire nonsense? If you think that that's not going to be an issue, maybe you just turn the podcast off. Maybe you just say, wow, I am a total idiot and a coward and I don't belong on a vampire hunting journey with people as excellent as Ken Bone, Yoshio Miki, and Carlos Matos. I don't belong. I'm going to sub myself out of the game. But for all of you that can totally appreciate the psychological pressure that goes with hunting vampires and needing a glue guy, to keep the team in high spirits, welcome aboard fully. So you split, you go to your liaising station, your time travel liaising station. I say, put in the coordinates, would you? And you say, I will. I say, remember what I said, Northern California, right on the border of Southern Oregon, years 1864. Capiche? And you're in. You put in the space-time coordinates, press a couple buttons, beep, boop, beep, boop, and we are there. We're there. And upon arrival, I lead everybody to a pretty cool changing room. It's kind of futuristic looking, and it's got a lot of cowboy gear in there because we're not going to show up looking like a bunch of squares, a bunch of hipsters or, you know, anybody who's thought they could wear sweatpants. I'm looking at you, Ken. We got to look the part. We got to go full Wild West. So we adorn our bodies with some pretty cool stuff. We all have Colt revolvers, two of them a piece. That's 10 revolvers. All the math whizzes were already there, but I needed to spell that out for people who maybe haven't done a multiplication table in a little while. Five of us, two guns a piece, that equals 10. Colt revolvers. Okay. We all have different hats. None of us wear the same hat. It just wouldn't make any sense. 
My hat is the coolest. Yours is the second coolest. Carlos thinks his hat is the coolest, and that speaks to his attitude. Ken is whatever, and Yoshio, bless his little heart, his hat doesn't fit well. It's too big. But everybody just gives him a thumbs up, and he kind of understands. And we're like, Yoshio, bringing you is the right thing to do, for sure. What else? What else is on the time machine before we step out into 1864? Northern California, right on the border of Southern Oregon. Horses, that's right. Some of you already guessed it. And you're like, oh, it's horses. Too clever. That's what some people criticize you for in your day-to-day, I would imagine. If you're a Darby cast doctor, how many people just come up to you and are like, hey, you're a little too uh, quick and clever for your own good. It's almost sickening. It makes me queasy how excellent you are in the brain. It's okay when people say that to you. You've learned how to tolerate that over the years. You struggled taking that compliment at first, but now you're great at it. Why am I telling you this? You already knew that. We get on our horses and they are fast. Stallions. Okay. We're not talking some dog shit horse. We're talking A plus horses. American Mustangs. Except for Ken. Ken's a heavy set fella, so he gets a working horse that's really slow but so sturdy, just like Ken. And we step out of the aircraft carrier kind of hangar bay, deck to the nines in cowboy attire with A plus horses, and we ride out. And obviously our time machine is invisible as not to startle the locals. And we just kind of show up on the scene. Immediately, people take notice. They take notice in a huge way because you're as good looking as you are. You're a total 10 is what you are. If you're a Darby cast doctor, not only are you clever to high hell, but what striking features you have, just in, you're in good shape. You're drawing a lot of attention. Let's be honest. I turn to Carlos and I say, hey, Carlos, can you believe how good our friend's looking? And he says, no, no, no. And you feel good about that. You should feel good about that. Carlos, piling on with some compliments. No problems there. So we're walking into town and it's a nameless, dusty, tumbleweed mining town. And we walk to the saloon. You kick open the doors and you say, hey, we're looking for vampires. And I just shoot you a look and I'm like, cutting straight to the chase. Whoa, that's really something, isn't it? And you just give me a knowing look and I'm like, all right. Yoshio goes to the bar and he starts pounding whiskey. There's a lot going on for all of us, but Yoshio is maybe the most overwhelmed because there's so many different things that he's not used to. Carlos, he can hang. Ken Bone, always down for a good time. You, total pro. Me, obviously, great guy in a lot of categories. I see that Yoshio is struggling a little bit. So I go to the bar with him and I slug down a couple of shots of whiskey and I give him a knowing look and you step on the other side of him. You take a couple of shots and then Carlos pipes in and says, Yay! and Yoshio's face just lights up and he's all of a sudden totally bought in and ready to go. And the barkeep, obviously named Horton, he says, oh, you're looking for vampires, are ya? And we say, yes, sir. Yes, we are in unison. And that lets Horton know how serious we are. That totally lets him know. He says, well, there's been some livestock that has been totally mutilated a couple miles northeast of here. And you say, 
Ken, mark it on the map. You are a smart scholar and nobody objects to that because that's correct. Ken Bone is so good with maps. So good with maps. Almost too good. That's uh, what some people have said. So Ken marks it on a map and we say, thanks, Horton. We'll maybe be back later. We hop on our horses and we trot that way. And as we're heading in that direction, we're passing a mountain range and there's an opening in the mountain range that says ye old silver mine. And that's important because we're hunting vampires and vampires hate silver. They hate it. So we go in there and it's, there's a bunch of silver just like laying around. And we're like, okay, this is easier than we thought it would be to get silver. It's exactly what we needed. Good thing that this didn't take us a long time to acquire. That would have been not the most fun thing to do. So we load up our saddlebags with silver and we keep riding towards that livestock war zone. And as we're riding, Ken looks over at you and says, you know, maybe the animals uh, could have been killed by chubacabras. And you say, Ken, for as wise as you are, you should know that the chubacabra is not native to this area. And Ken says, oh, my mistake. And that's just so like refreshing to have Ken have the humility to be like, oh yeah, totally, I blew it. Carlos pipes in, says, I am right now independently, financially independently. Right now I am reaching $140,000. And we all kind of chuckle a little bit and we ride on. It's getting dark though. And you know what that means. We got to build camp. We're all pretty tired, but you know who isn't tired? That's right. Yoshio Miki. He just runs around grabbing stuff. And it's like, I totally see why you qualified for the hurdles in the 28 games. You are fast, man. And he gathers all the supplies. He builds a fire. He fashions a couple lean twos. And it's like, Yoshio, you didn't have to do all this, man. And Carlos echoes that sentiment and says, Guys, I want to tell you something. Ken Bone, elite scholar, finds some bricks laying around and he fashions a little oven to smelt silver into bullets. And it's like, Ken. What's going on there, huh, pal? And he gives you this coy little grin and it's like, Ken, don't do that, man. Every time you smile, Ken, it's just, it's a little too creepy. We love you, but keep the face neutral, would you? Just for all of us. And Ken gets it. So he just kind of goes neutral face. And it's like, Ken, you keep proving yourself time and time again as an asset to the posse. Really great. Hold on, let's take a time out. A lot of you are thinking to yourselves right now, like, wait, how is Ken making bullets? This seems like a little much. And to that, I say, let me refer you to Carlos and he's going to tell you about faith and belief. And so Carlos says, Faith and belief is the one thing that we'll need to be able to change the world. And you just pause for a second. You're like, wow, I was out of line. I was totally out of line. So Ken goes back to making a lot of silver bullets, a lot of them. And he makes some silver katanas for Yoshio Miki. Yoshio takes a deep bow and it's like, dude, I love your culture. Showing respect with the physical thank you. Nonverbal, very powerful. We all like that. We all like that a lot. We're getting a little drowsy and we all pass out. And we wake up in the morning and something's not right with Ken. It's just not, he doesn't have his normal scholarly vibe to him. He just seems angry. And Yoshio's the first one to pick up on it. And he's like looking at us, giving that nonverbal, like what, what's going on with Ken? Huh? And we all look at each other and we're like, that's a fair question. Carlos 
naturally pipes in with. Guys, I want to tell you something. Whoa, 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 whoa. what's up? Which cuts straight to all of our core. And we realize in that moment that Ken was bitten by a vampire in the night. Oh, boy. This leaves us with a tough choice. And as I turn to you and say, what do we do about Ken? He's obviously a vampire. He's photosensitive. The light is hurting him. The daylight, the dawn, it is hurting him. It's burning his skin. Yoshio lops Ken's head off with a silver katana. And Ken is dead. But it wasn't really Ken anymore, was it? Because he's a vampire. But we're going to miss Ken, aren't we? Your heart just sank in your chest a little bit. You're like, oh man, Ken was such a value add. And now he's toast. Carlos wasn't excited about the way Ken went down. And he lets everybody know with a loud, no, no, no. And that gets you pretty upset because you knew what had to be done. You knew exactly what had to be done. So all of a sudden you're getting in Carlos's face. Yoshio's looking despondent because he just killed Ken. And then all of a sudden, Carlos is yelling at Yoshio. You're yelling at Carlos. And what do I do? That's right, glue guy. I go around to each one of you and I hug you. And I say, come on, guys. Enough of that. We're a posse. We're a team. And after I give each of you a hug, I make eye contact while saying this sentence. I slowly move my eye contact, but I say, guys, that's the way Ken would have wanted to go. And in that moment, we all realize we got to do some damage to a vampire or a bunch of vampires because we don't know what happened. We were asleep. How did it happen? We don't know. The only guy who might be able to know was Ken. And we all know what happened to Ken. So we bury him upside down and throw his head on a pike. And that's just how you got to do it. It's customary for a vampire burial because you don't want him to reanimate. We all know this. And we move on. We've got our silver bullets. Yoshio's got the silver katanas. We are down one posse member, but we are still strong because of the hugs that I gave everybody and the pep talk, which was really just the most concise, high-impact eulogy that anybody has ever heard, ever. We ride on, and by midday, we've made it to this pasture where there are rotting carcasses everywhere. Cows, horses, sheep, goats, pigs. Whoever was running this farm didn't keep things really separate, which is totally lazy. And not a good way to run a farm. So kind of got what was coming to him. But at the same time, it's like, we've got an issue here because there's a lot of dead animals. I look at you and say, go find clues. And you say, okay. Then I look at Carlos and say, what are you thinking, man? And he responds. Guys, I want to tell you something. The world is not anymore the way it used to be. And boy, did we all need to hear that. Right then and there. Boy, did we just need that. 100%. Yoshio goes for a jog because he's an athlete and he's got to keep his conditioning up. And it's like, do you, man. Good job. You're searching around for clues. And you're really going for it. You're getting dirty. You're getting dusty. You're touching dead animals. And I'm like, wow, I... Didn't want to do that. Thanks for stepping up. And you end up finding some gold coins inside the animal carcasses. You say, hey, posse leader, you're talking to me. Hey, posse leader, my friend, my colleague, what's going on here? And I say, Wells Fargo, son of a bitch. It's these coins. It's these Wells Fargo coins. So the vampires work for Wells Fargo. That's horse shit. Nightfall fast approaching. 
and on the horizon, at dusk, we see a couple wagons. And on the side of those wagons, it reads, Wells Fargo. Surprise, surprise. And right as the sun goes down, the stagecoach drivers all explode and turn into bats because they're vampires and they start circling us. You are great with revolvers. If somebody offered you an AK-47 full of silver bullets in that moment, you would 100% turn to them and say, no thanks, I'm all set. And start blasting with revolvers. And blast with revolvers you do. I get in on it too. So does Carlos. And man, Carlos is a good shot. And his hellish cackles are making the vampires pretty scared. I'm going to be honest with you. (laughs) These half demon vampire bat beasts are flying around and they're like, good Lord, what's going on with that guy? And that's why we brought him. High intensity public speaker. That's who Carlos Matos is. Better believe it. Then all of a sudden, all the bats congeal and turn into a werewolf. It's the last thing we wanted to see. That is the absolute last thing we wanted to see. And this werewolf is huge and he's coming straight for Yoshio Miki. So we start shooting at his kneecaps. The, the werewolf. Vampire amalgam. We shoot him in the kneecaps. Because we need answers. We want to take this beast down, do a bunch of damage to him, and then say, what the hell is going on with you? Horton, the bartender, didn't know what was going on. and We want to stop what you're doing, and then we want to tell Horton what's up, because we owe him that much. He comped us whiskey shots. So we popped the hell out of that werewolf's kneecaps, and they're just totally exploded. And then the werewolf disintegrates into 15 individual vampires. And, and they're all really ugly looking. Just disgusting people. These really shady characters, all of whom look like could spontaneously whip out a lease to a 1982 Miata and say, sign here. Pretty dangerous. And you, you look around them you say i hate you guys i hate you i'm like well said and then it's yoshio's turn and he just goes up to all of them and he just slices them with the katana not super deep but he gives every single vampire a lot of cuts and they are hurting really bad and you look at yoshio and you're like I don't like what they did to the livestock and I am fine with you exacting the level of subtle and catastrophic violence that you are on these creatures. You say that to him and he doesn't understand a word, but he totally gets it. You've probably had an encounter like that in your life. You've said something that just didn't make sense to the person, but they totally got it at the same time. Feels real nice. And you go up to the lead vampire. You say, why are you doing this, you son of a bitch? Why are you hurting animals? And why are you stuffing them full of gold coins? That's so weird. And he responds, says, I'm, I don't know. Honestly, I didn't even really think about it. I just started doing it and things got really out of hand. And we all appreciate that level of honesty. And we're like, that's really cool that you could recognize that you were going down a rough path. But at some point, you got to put your foot down and say, I shouldn't murder animals and hurt guys, amateur cartographers and elite scholars like Ken Bone. I shouldn't hurt them just because that's what I've been doing need to intervene in that. You need to say, wait, what am I doing? Cut it out, right? Have a little one-on-one with yourself. 
for schooling this vampire leader on what it means to reform your conduct from the inside out. He needed that. He needed that. We say, why'd you get a job at Wells Fargo? And he's like, I don't know. My dad told me that I should. And I'm pretty good with numbers. And it's like, well, what did you really, what did you want to do? And the vampire's like, I wanted to be a farmer. I wanted to raise animals. It's like, well, look at what you're doing now. This is terrible. Now let's pause for a second. A lot of you right now are saying, what the hell is happening right now? And I'll tell you what's happening. A deep moment of reflection in a vampire. Okay? That's what's happening. That's totally what's happening. But what else is happening? This is a Darby Cast Economics Wednesday. And of course, this story is littered, exploding at the seams with economic lessons. And I suppose I should have, for the new people, really prefaced the episode like, hey, find the economic lessons. But maybe you just listen to this whole thing again. How is this going to show up for you in your everyday life? Who are you going to confront and say, what are you doing? Hey, this is a little out of hand, right? You wanted to do something else when you were growing up. And now look at you. You killed Ken Bone. But back to it. You're looking at the vampire leader. You say, look at all these losers you're hanging out with. You're better than this, man. And he says, no, I'm not. And you say, yes, you are vampire leader. And vampire leader, that's his name, says, good Lord, you're inspirational. I'm going to do things by the book. And then he turns into a land octopus as some vampires can, and he murders the rest of the vampire crew because they were all dirtbags, incapable of self-reflection and ultimately a little personal reform. Carlos has been pretty quiet for this, but then all of a sudden he just calls out. So guys, let me tell you, I love... it we hop back on the horses and we make our way back to the time machine we go back to the present moment and you're never really the same you're never really the same you just made a new best friend in carlos matos you two are pretty much inseparable from here on out obviously carlos great guy and of course everybody is wondering right now what of Yoshio Miki? What of Yoshio? And I tell you what, we drop him off at the 28 games, but we give him a couple EpiPens and some steroids. We say, Yoshio, time for you to show up. And then Yoshio gets gold in the hurdles and a bunch of other events and becomes one of the most decorated Japanese Olympians of all time, rewriting the history books. Really, really something. But that's Darby Cast. That's Economics Wednesday. Some of you right now are thinking to yourselves, I don't know if that story really wrapped up in a way that is satisfying for me. And to that I say, well, maybe this podcast isn't for you. You get lost. And I know it's going to weigh on all of us heavily, especially Carlos, that Ken Bone left on that trip and didn't come back. But before we all go our separate ways, I take everybody into a semicircle, and I say, here's the deal. Be the change you want to see in the world. And nobody knows who that quote is by, except for me. And everybody, yourself included, says, wow, is that original? And I say, yeah, yeah, it is. The end. Darby Cast, Economics Wednesday. <laughs>